Uh, how many fathers are in the room? Raise your hand, really? Okay. Okay, so men, um, when I say something like, did you have a good Father's Day last week? This is what we don't want to hear. And that's what I kind of heard. So um, <clears throat> little wink, wink, nudge, nudge, men. Hey, did we have a good Father's Day last week? Yeah! yeah! Okay, good. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Um, I'm excited about this month. I've got some, um, we've got some friends that are coming to join us at Journey. I, I don't even know what to call this. I, I shot a note to our, our leadership team uh, earlier this week, and I said, hey, I've got some people coming. Maybe we'll call it our Summer Spirit Speaking Series or something like that. Um, some little, um, something like, I, I don't know what we'll call it. But what I want to tell you is that uh, we have four friends of, of mine and, and mentors of mine and four friends of Journey coming to speak um, over, the next, uh, over the next six weeks or so. I'll be here, uh, they'll be here as well. But Dale Crawl is coming in two weeks. Dale, um, uh, I can't wait to reintroduce you to him. He's been a mentor of mine for years. He discipled me for three years. Incredible man. Gonna be here on July 9th. Um, ran a campus ministry down in Carbondale, Illinois for about 27 years. Saw literally nations changed because of what God did through that campus ministry. Very, very powerful. Um, uh, went and spoke at a church of, uh, of 700,000 in Seoul, South Korea. Um, saw, had, saw faculty members healed of crippling diseases. I mean, crazy, crazy stuff. And so he'll be here. I'm excited about that. And then we've got William Preston coming back. I know you all like William. He's pretty awesome. Yeah, right? William will be here in a few weeks um, um, speaking as well. Um, and really excited about William. He's just a good friend of mine from Peoria, um, City on the Hill Church, a powerful, powerful um, man of God, loves this church. John King is going to be coming on July 23rd. If you all know John King, yeah, I'm liking this. I'm liking this too. All right, we're all excited. John King's coming on July 23rd. Um, he's a mentor of mine. He was the um, lead pastor at Riverside Community Church in Peoria. And, um, and he takes the time to just mentor me and love on me in my life and by proxy this church. And so he's really excited to come. And then on August 9th, Cal Rickner, um, who is, uh, well, is just stepped down as the senior pastor of Northwood Church, a spirit-filled church in Peoria, Illinois. Um, incredible, incredible guy. He's going to be here speaking. So guys, I'm excited. So um, don't, let me just say this. Don't take the summer off. Drive Dig into this summer and let God prepare you for all he wants to do this fall. Let's dig in this summer. Amen? And if you're on the road, you can see it on, on Facebook or whatever. But I, I want you guys to hear. I want you people. You, I want us to receive what they have for us so that we can be built. And, and that's something that we want to do here at Journey. We, um, we want to get people in here to speak to you that, that are outside this body but love us inside this body. And they've got something really excited for you. Um, this morning during, uh, during worship, we had three people um, just feel like God gave them a word. Um, and I want to share those with you because, I, you know, the Bible talks about that um, in, I believe it's 2 Corinthians, that, that all of us need to come to, um, to our fellowships together with a word. And if you hear something, I want to hear it. And uh, uh, Bryce Tubal, uh, Bryce, I'm going to get this a little bit wrong, um, but it was a I got the roar like lion. What was the first part? Yeah, that was the word. He said, the church has become so much domesticated, but the time has come to roar like a lion. Amen. Amen. That, that, that we have become domesticated. Guys, I, I would rather have church on a Sunday morning look a little bit messy and, or, um, you know, when we go out. And not just this, this is an hour and a half out of your week. This is 90 minutes of, of a week, or maybe 93 or 94 minutes, depending on the Sunday, right? But um, when we go out, when we are the church in this community, man, I don't want to be domesticated. I want to be fearless in my workplace. I want to be fearless in my family. Listen, I want to be fearless for my workplace. I want to be fearless for my family. And I want to embrace that, that word that God gave us this morning. Julie... Um, felt a word, Julie Tubal felt a word this morning that we need to press through the ceiling, that whatever it is that's holding you down, whatever it looks like you can't get through that, God is saying the time has come to press through that ceiling. Amen? Amen. So don't be domesticated. Roar like a lion. Press through the ceiling. These guys didn't share notes. 
And then Angie um, Lugenbuehl had a word on her heart, and I, I said, text it to me, Angie, because I'll totally blow this if you don't text it. So we were singing Amazing Grace. This is what she, she felt the Lord speaking. The hour we first believed, we knew in that moment. So think of the hour. If you've given your life to Jesus, think about that hour you first believed. That moment. Most of you can remember it. Um, we knew in that moment that we could no longer do it, it being life and everything on our own. But Satan tries to trick us into thinking that even though we start with grace, it's up to us to cross the finish line alone by our power. And by the way, this, me- this word goes right into our message. I mean, right into our message. So though we start with grace, the enemy tricks us into thinking it's up to the- us to cross the finish line on our own by our own power. And then she asked the question, or the Lord gave her this question, how does grace actually relieve our fears? How does grace, the hour we first believe, actually relieve our fears? Our fears that we aren't enough, that we won't make it. How does grace do that? Grace speaks to our fears and says that same precious surrender that began, that we began with is all that matters all the way to the end. God's grace will follow you all the way to the end. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to worry that you're not enough. This is Angie's words, Jesus through her. He was enough. He is enough, and he will always be enough. Can you say amen? And that goes right into our message this morning. So um, if you have a Bible with you, open up to Psalm 133. If you're ever curious, I mostly use the New King James Version if you're trying to figure it but the, you know, they're all good. Um, what would Jesus undo? What would Jesus undo? The last message in this series. We touched on this a little bit in another one. Jesus would undo disunity. Jesus would undo disunity. And there's so much scripture on this. There's so much. I challenge you to go to one of my favorite Bible um, websites, openbible.hub. Um, they have this word, um, Bible mosh up is what they call it. And you just type in, what does the Bible say about this? And it'll just crank out a ton of scriptures so you can study stuff real quick on that. Um, but if you put, what does the Bible say about unity or disunity? It says so much. Because God has created us to be together. God has created us, that message that Angie said, to get across the finish line. We can't make it across the finish line very well on our own. We are created social creatures and we need each other. We are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones, plural, plural. God says that he wants us together, unified in all things. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures on this. But Psalm 133, listen to this. Behold, listen really good. Behold, how good and pl- God is saying, look, look at this thing. I want to show you. Behold, look at what I'm about to tell you, God is saying. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers, brethren. Pause there. Who, who is brethren? Family, marriage, church, relationships. Friends, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then he says some stuff that we don't understand. Um, it's like the precious oil upon the beard running on, on the beard to the beard of Aaron running down the edge of his garments. Too much there and not enough time to talk about what all that means. It's like the dew of Hermon descending on the mountains of Zion. But this is what he says, for there, where there is unity, for there, God every, or the Lord, everyone read this with me commanded put it up there on the screen if you could verse 3 for there the lord commanded the blessing life forevermore listen to that again for there where there is unity among the brethren in your families in your church in your relationships where there is unity for there the lord commanded commanded say it with me church commanded oh you didn't say that loud enough commanded a blessing. And what is the blessing? Life forevermore. How many of you want a little piece of that? I want that. So what does this tell us? It says that this, God searches for unity. God is searching for unity. God is searching for families, for people, for churches um, that forgive one another, that, um, that keep communication open with one another. 
He said, I find it beautiful, so beautiful, where people dwell together in unity. Think of it this way. God, God is saying this. I, you know, John, um, John the Baptist said, I'm the one who, who um, is calling out in the desert saying, prepare a highway for the Lord, right? So John, John the Baptist was saying, my job on this earth is to create a highway, to create a path for Jesus to come down and to preach his word. And by proxy, he's creating a, a path to get his word onto this earth. But the Holy Spirit is looking for a landing place for God's blessing. The Holy Spirit is saying, I want to find a landing strip for a blessing. And so Satan has had this one desire from the beginning of time. He, the, the, he's come to kill, steal, and destroy. He's come to divide and conquer churches, families, homes, relationships, brothers and sisters, grandparents, grandchildren. He comes to divide. The scripture says that the day is coming where he'll be successful in that. And I'm going to turn mothers-in-laws against daughters-in-laws and fathers against sons and children against their parents. That day is coming. But he is saying this. I know this. The enemy says, I, there's one thing that I fear more than anything else, and it's unity of the brethren. Unity, unity, unity. This is where two or more agree, there I will be. Just two. Just two. Matthew 18, where two more are gathered together in my name, I will be there. But do you know what that verse is about? And this is going to be a short message. This is going to be a really simple message today. I'm just going to tell you a story. Think about that. Matthew chapter 18 where two or more gather in my name, there I am as well. You've heard me preach this before. But that is talking about two disunified parties. This is the actual context of Matthew 18. That said, when they come together, not to grab a pound of flesh, not to try and hurt one another, not to try and prove their point, not to try and be right, not to try and beat their chest in the marriage, not to, to um, sound the alarm and get a big audience, but where two or more are gathered, in my name, because they want to be reconciled more than anything in the world with this other person. He said, God says, you can bet your life, I will be there for that conversation. What would Jesus undo? This unity. I listened to, I'm going to give full credit where it's due. I listened to um, a message, I listened to a lot of messages online and uh, when I'm running. I used to watch Netflix when I was running on a treadmill and Nancy said, why are you doing that? She goes, don't do that. She goes, this, you don't want to watch the Avengers. Listen to some, get the word in you. <laughs> so I get the word in me um, when, I, when I'm running on the treadmill or whatever. I listened to a message um, recently by one of my favorite pastors, <laughs> Jenison Franklin. And he preached a message where he shared a story about a crewing team, a rowing team. And so full credit to this man who brought a, a key message into my life with, with many of, much of it I'm going to, bring to you today, because I think it's so, it's just so, God wants us to hear this today. Why don't you go through that, throw that picture up on the screen, that first picture, Elliot. So there's a sport, so again, I'm not going to wow you with a lot of theological stuff at all today, I just want to talk about rowing. It's a sport, it's called crew, it's an eight they, they do this all in different teams. They have four-member crews. They have two-member crews. They have solo events, which is not crew, rowing, solo rowing. But the biggest event in the rowing world, and it's an Olympic event, um, is called crew. And there are no superstars in crew. There's no um, um, Kobe Bryant's or Michael Jordan's or I don't even know who the big sports stars are. I'm a little detached. Someone throw out a name for me. Luke, you know any? All right. <laughs> there's no stars. In fact, there's, everyone is so, um, so uh, not superstar that they call it crew. It's dependent on people. If you look at that boat, that's a 24-inch wide boat. So we think, man, the, you know, it'd be easy to get on that. It's a 24-inch wide boat. They say that the average boat, based on the, the weight of the boat and the number of people on it and the, the weight of the oars, that on that 24 inch wide boat, if you think about that, it's about that big. Think about just getting on that boat, right? I think if I were the comp comp competition, the judge, I would say, whoever gets on the boat the quickest and the best and no one falls in the water, you win. You don't even have to row, right? 
You got on the boat. Congratulations. Everyone gets a star. 24 inches wide, 1,800 to 2,000 pounds goes on that boat. Just, Lou, do you remember when you and Don, oh gosh, <laughs> you remember that? So I go way back with the Fritzens. Um, their family just kind of took me in when I was young. Um, um, and we did some stuff. Um, we went on a little boating event. Um, I came home from hanging out with the Fritzens and I was kind of wet. My, my shoes were squishy and my mom said, what happened with the Fritzens today? <laughs> I tried to get on a big rowboat. That's all I had to do. That was my test, get on the boat. Well, I got on the boat, eventually. Yeah, I tipped the boat, and yeah. And that was a big boat. So then that was just one of me, 24 inch wide, eight people, plus the coach, nine people, crew. So here's what we know about, about crew. Crew is dependent on picking the right people. It's actually, you know, I've seen these guys do this before. I'm like, I could do that sport. I could be a crewer. I, I could do what they do. But it's incredibly complicated. And they say the only way to be successful in the sport of crew is to have the exact right eight people and the exact right coach. And it's very, very hard to do. Very hard to do. And a little bit more about crew. So that coach up front, his job is simply to be the voice of the crew. And if you look at that boat real closely, you'll see this, that they're rowing this way. So the direction that they're going, their backs are to it. Their backs are to it. So they are completely dependent on listening to what that coach is saying about the direction that they're supposed to go. And if they fail to listen or fail to do what he says to do, they will immediately go off the wrong direction. Think about this. For six minutes, they row in one direction perfectly straight. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever gone on even just a little canoe trip with one other person? Man, you're going sideways. <laughs> That's just two people on a canoe. This is eight people. Do you, you guys see this? So there's a, there's a book called The Boys in the Boat, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And it was a book about nine young people who were rowing in the Olympics from the United States of America in 1936, Berlin. And in that book, it said that the same, this is how difficult it is. And this was not a joke. They said, this is exactly how it is. They said, if you want to know how difficult it is to get eight rowers plus a coach all rowing in the same direction, just get them rowing in the same direction, not even the speed, not even the winning the race, but just get them rowing at the same pace in the same direction for six minutes. They said, some of you golfers will appreciate this. They say, it's, it, this is it. This is the scientific thing, not a joke. They said, get eight people, stand them on a log on the water, and have them all set down their golf ball. Guys, I can't even get a golf ball to stay on the tee, all right? Set the golf ball down, and at the same time, with the same force and the exact same swing and the exact same follow-through, all hit the ball at exactly the same time, spin around like that, the ball goes in completely the exact same direction, and then reset and do that every, um, every four seconds for six minutes. Are you starting to get a picture of this? This is, no, this is no easy sport. It's incredibly hard. They say that the sport of crewing takes incredible muscle power, like uh, unbelievable. Every muscle is in play. If you've ever been on a rower machine, you'll know what I'm talking about. You, you think, well, that looks easy. I'm gonna do the rower because that's the easy thing. It is not easy. It's not easy. Um, they say your quads, your, your back, your biceps, your tries, every muscle is in play. Even your neck muscles are in play. They say that the <clears throat> amount of oxygen that a rower will use during a six minute race per minute is the same amount of oxygen that a racehorse will consume, about eight liters of oxygen. They say for comparison, if you have a football player who's played a whole game and they're on a full sprint to go catch a ball, they say that that football player will burn about three to four liters compared to eight. They say that when they finish up on this, um, in this race, most of the men on that boat are ready to pass out. And they say some of them actually do pass out at the end of the race. It's an incredibly difficult event. Not one paddle can be late. Not one person can be out of sync. Even the, the way they direction their bodies has to be the same. So you need to win that race. You have to have the right boat, with the right 
oarsman with a winning strategy, with the right attitude, with a great coach, the perfect coach. You've got to have all that. And when that all comes together, and this is what's really cool, um, they say when that all comes together, um, and sometimes that won't come together in a race perfectly, but they say there's something in a race that everybody tries to get to and they rarely do. And they say, they describe it as this magical, mysterious, glorious moment that when they're rowing, they're in such unity. And they say this, that the, that the average race, when you're full out on a sprint for six minutes, you're pulling that over 40 to, 40, 40 to 45 times per minute. But they say this, that when they get into that perfect rhythm, there's something mysterious and glorious that they call the swing, the swing. And they say when they hit that swing, and sometimes you actually slow your pace, when they're in such unity that everyone else is going 40, 45 times a minute, they say sometimes they can slow down to 35, 34, 33, and it's like the boat lifts off from the water and they will actually beat the ones who are toiling with all their strength for one reason and one reason only, because they are in unity. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Unity is better than strength. In your marriage, in your friendships, in your family, in your church, in your workplaces. How, and this is why God says, listen to this again, because God sees this, he sees I think there's a parallel between the natural and the supernatural because God says, how blessed. He goes, behold. Think about that, that first verse that we read. Behold, he's saying, would you guys come look at this right here? Behold, they're in the swing. They're effortless. Oh, they're working, but, but compared to everyone else, how blessed is it where brothers, when brothers dwell together in unity, in unity? How blessed is it? Here's one other important point, and then I'm going to make three quick points. Um, they say that when a coach is picking a team, if you looked around this room right now, right now I'm looking around, and man, we all look different. Everyone turn to someone next to you and say, you look different. <laughs> you look different. Yeah. Don't be offended. Remember Matthew chapter 24, many become offended and Betray one another, hate one another, so don't get offended. But when they say when a coach is looking for a crew, they, they do not want clones. They don't want people that do the exact same thing. You know what's really interesting? The, the German government, Hitler, um, the Aryan Brotherhood, sickening, satanic, demonic, um, they were looking to make clones. They were looking to create an Aryan race, an all-white, non-Jewish, the, the, the religion is the, is the state, um, they wanted clones. They wanted everyone to look exactly alike. Hitler's youth. They wanted so when they cast characters for their crew, they would try to get clones, people that were exactly the same. But the good crews, the good coaches know that I need someone. I need people completely different. I need I need someone. Look at that picture. Those are about the same height. That guy in the back's a little bit short. Maybe that's why they put him in the back. That guy in the middle with the no hat on. He looks like he's huffing and puffing. That guy's got no hair. That guy in the front, he's about two feet tall, right, the coach? But they're different because there's a realization among the coaches in championship and Olympic crewing that some, you need some people with short legs because they can push off faster. You need some people with longer arms because they can pull a little harder to compensate for people with the short legs. You need some people with incredible core strength to make up for some of the people that don't have the right arm strength because at some point in the race, you're gonna to need to flip flop which muscle group you're relying on the most. Do you see that? This guy's legs are going out, but that's okay because my arms are just starting to go. Unity. You gotta have a, a different band of people. And that's why I said, look around because guys, we are a different group of people. We all look really, really different. And your strengths, thank God, are not my strengths. And my strengths, thank God, are not yours. But I need you to be you in Jesus, and I need you, you need me to be me, and you gotta pick your crew carefully. You gotta pick carefully. And so if you're running with the wrong crew, listen to me. Let me just say this. They say the way the, way, the, the, way the race is won is when the team hits swing and that diverse group of people, totally different, all come together in unity. And God says, behold, 
It's a beautiful thing. So here's your quick three points. Remember, my kids have been training me. If you're going to set up, because my kids have better strengths than me, all right? Here's your quick three points on this. Number one is this. When, when going for unity, you've got to choose your crew wisely. Choose your crew wisely. Your family, your spouse, your friends, your church, even, even the place you work. Sometimes I've counseled people, maybe you want to get out of that workplace and find someplace else to work. You're not going to find the perfect place, but, but who's your crew? Who does God want you to work with? Who does God want you to walk in unity with? This is why the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. You know, sometimes we think that's just about dating. And by the way, singles, that is about dating. It's definitely about dating. Don't, don't, don't. And it doesn't just mean this, that he believes, she believes. We both believe there is a God. Well, listen, the Bible says demons believe there's a God. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not saying your date is a demon, but I'm saying, <laughs> I'm not saying they're not, all right? Even the demons believe in God and, and shudder. But, 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 but it, yoke up with someone that is going the same direction. We'll talk about that in a minute. This is why God says, don't be unequally yoked. To an unbeliever. Many of us are trying to sometimes walk out in life unity with someone who's incapable of walking with it in unity because they don't even serve Jesus. Or they're not even, or, or they, they're serving him, but they're doing it in a completely different way. It's okay that you're farther down the road than some, and some are farther back. Because if you're way down the road with Jesus, I guarantee you there's someone way farther down than you, right? But God says, I want you to walk together in unity, unity of spirit with someone that that knows the Jesus that you serve, that they're going the same direction. Pick your crew wisely. The coach always picks people of diverse strengths. He picks rowers. He picks people uh, of all shapes and sizes, but he, this is what he does. He says the one thing you need to be absolutely the same in is you need to be a person who is determined to listen to coach Jesus and go wherever he wants to go. Do you follow that? Wherever you want to go, Jesus, that coat, that, that boat will go off track so fast. Everyone on that boat has to have one decision. They're completely different people, all top athletes, but their one thing is I'm going to listen to what that guy says, and even though I don't know where I'm going, I'm going to follow him no matter what he says. Do you see the spiritual truth in that? Amen? If you're running with the wrong crew, your life could go, your boat could go in a totally different direction, and you could end up in some place you, you, you dreamed and hoped you would never, ever be. But can, man, I could go off in this in a minute, but you start listening to the wrong person, and that one inch off, that little discernment of maybe I shouldn't be going this direction, six minutes from then, they're going the other way. Do you guys see the, do you see this? Don't run with the wrong crew. Be wise. So listen, when, when you think about your crew, um, who do you want to surround yourself? Can I tell you who to surround yourself with? Encouragers. Surround yourself with people that, that have a faith to see that God is going to work powerfully in your life. Surround yourself with people that believe that God has a plan for your life and they're committed. When we had Wayne and Wiley to come up here with their cute little girl, and I want to do that again. I want to hold her next time. I kind of was, I was a little shaky that day. But anyway... Um, we were committing as a church that we see the vision that this couple has for their child and we're all behind them, right? We're unified that we're going to do all we can do all in our power and woe be to anyone who would do anything to, to draw that little precious child away from the faith that they're leading God in. They come to journey because they say, you know what? It's not the perfect church, right? We figured that out of our pancakes 10 years ago, didn't we, Wayne? It's not the perfect church, but I can tell you this. We all want to be around the one who is perfect. And I want to become more like him. And I want you to become more like him. And I need you to talk. Be around encouragers. Be around people who believe that, they're, that have the faith to see God work powerfully in your life. Um, don't hang out with fools. <laughs> a, companion, a companion of fools suffers harm. Choose your crews wisely. Don't hang around people who are negative or gossips or slanders. Because one day they will gossip, backstab, and slander you. All right? Be around people that the Bible says are quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, quick to forgive. People that don't harbor offenses but, but fight to resolve them. People with a desire for reconciliation, not a pound of flesh. 
um, where two or more are gathered, he'd say, this is who I want you to be in with. We coach our kids, um, all of our kids, and any young adult that will listen to us or any person that's not married, and say, listen, when you are wanting to get married, start rowing your boat in the, look to your, to, to that guy right there in front of you, and whatever he's saying, Jesus, you just start rowing your boat that way. You start rowing your boat, and you stay committed to him. You row your boat. I don't know where I'm going, but I know I'm going with Jesus. That's where I'm going. And you listen to that coach, and you keep rowing, unmarried young person, unmarried older person. You keep rowing. And what we tell them to do is, while you're running that race, rowing that race that God has called you to, look to your left and your right. And if you see someone rowing at the same pace after the same God in the same way, I'm not saying they're the one. Could she be the one? No. But I'm saying this. They might just be someone God wants on your boat. Or you know what? You might want to get on theirs. Choose your crew wisely. Number two, encourage your crew. Encourage your crew if you're taking notes. Let me, t- let me tell you this. Repeat this, to me, this after me. It's not about me. Say that. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's about unity of spirit. It's not rowing at your own pace. In a marriage, it's not about just my needs being met, but it's about me meeting my wife's needs or my, my, my spouse's needs, my husband's needs. It's not about just, listen to this, it's not just about my family succeeding, that I'm going to get where I want to go, you know, you know, darn whoever gets in front of me, but it's about I want your families to succeed, and I want my family to be a blessing to your family, and vice versa. It's about making sure that we all do that all we can do collectively it's like the vision that Angie had, the word that Angie had, that we all get across that finish line together. I don't want to just be up in heaven alone saying, man, we made it, kids and wife. No, I want to be up there with you guys. And the only way to do that is for me to use my strength and you to use yours, to overlook offenses, to, to, to bear with one another. It's not about me. It's about me identifying when you are weak so that I can come in and be strong for you and that you can see when I'm suffering so you can come in and you can be strong for me. And that's one of the reasons we get together every week is to encourage one another while the day is, while the, while the light is here. That's what the Bible says. Encourage each other while there is day. Encourage each other now while we're together. Right now, don't wait for a, uh, if, if God puts someone on your heart, text them, call them. If God wants you to give to someone, Give to them. You know, the Bible says if you have something to give to somebody, don't wait and, uh, and you have it there with you. Don't wait until later and say, I'll give it to them later. Give it to them now. Encourage one another. Give to one another. Help other people. Determine there's nothing better in your life than you can say, I'm not going to live about me. I'm going to live for you so that I can bless them and I'll be blessed in return. And even if I'm not blessed in return, I'm blessed because I was able to be a blessing because the Bible says he who refreshes will himself be refreshed. Man, this is good stuff. (laughs) Everyone say that. Man, this is good stuff. Thank you, Jenison Franklin. (laughs) I want my marriage to be this way. I want my family to be this way. I want my church to be this way. If you look at the books of Acts, chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, um, it, the title of the thing, it says, Coming the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. What, what that means is this. It means that no one was doing their own thing. God said, I can accomplish so much more with you as a group than I can with you apart. Let me give you guys some quick verses. Philippians 2.1. Therefore, there's, if there's any consolation of Christ, if any comfort, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, he's saying, listen, if there's anything, um, it's fellowship with one another. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I plead with you, brethren... By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no, say it with me, church, divisions. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind 
and then the same judgment. It does, and remember, this doesn't mean you're clones. But it means this, on, on the major things of life, we are going to be together on this thing. Forgiveness, um, the lordship of Christ, following after him with all our heart, blessing one another, not being easily offended, dealing with it. Ver, John 13, 35, by this all we know that you are my disciples. Listen to this. By this, all of us will know, uh, all will know that you are my disciples, that you have a journey magnet on your car. No, actually, guys, there's been times, there was a time recently I was a little bit late for church, just a little bit. It's going a little bit fast. And as I passed a car, I remembered that my, my license plate says narrow road, and I've got a big fat journey sticker right next to it. I, I'm just saying, no, it says, because um, they will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. It's the biggest way. We don't love one another. Please don't rip on a Christian and tear him up and shred him and then go out and tell somebody you love Jesus because it could do damage. Finally, brethren, 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Um, finally, brethren, farewell, become complete, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Listen, listen to this. Let each esteem others better than himself. Power of unity. Our, our uh, Dave Vestal, who spoke a couple weeks ago, our, our gateway, the guy who kind of consultant, pastor, mentor to me, he says this, he goes, the power of unity is the power of we. We, we can go so much farther together. We gotta have one another. And God, the Bible says, will command a blessing. Last thing, so you uh, ch um, choose your crew wisely, you encourage your crew. Listen, here's the last thing. Nina, if you wanna, or uh, Sophie, do you mind coming up? Um, follow your coach. The disciples were out on the boat, so um, John 6, 21, we're gonna go there. Don't put it up quite yet, but, um, the context of that verse, they were out on the boat, the disciples were, they were about five miles smack in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, five miles out on the lake, the sea, trying to get where they were. And it said the, the winds were bad, they were prevailing, they couldn't make any headway, they're rowing as, as hard as they can. There's that analogy, but it was real, they were rowing. They, they said they couldn't make any headway, one scripture says, because the winds were contrary, they couldn't do it. But then they see Jesus walking out on the water. And listen to this. They saw Jesus, so they're in the middle of their storm. They're toiling. What about you? Toiling in your family, toiling at work, toiling in your marriage, toiling, toiling, toiling. You can't as hard as you can with your own strength. But then it said in John 6, 21, and I know this is simple. I told you this would be a simple message. Then they willingly received him, Jesus, into the boat. And listen to this. Immediately, the boat was at the land where they were going. So here's your simple application. Think about that. I never saw that until I listened to that message. They willingly received him into the boat. And remember, these were people that were already following Jesus, okay? So we need to receive Jesus into our boat, but they were already following him. So this is talking about believers in the midst of their storm. Willingly received him into the boat and immediately, five miles away, they got to where Jesus wanted them to go the whole time. Never would have made it. Here's your simple point. Jesus can get you through your storm. I don't know if it'll be that fast as the disciples on that day, but I can promise you if we willingly invite him into those relationships, into that place of disunity, because remember, that's what we're calling, talking about Jesus would undo disunity. If we willingly invite him into that place of disunity, if we come in Matthew chapter 18 saying, I've come here for reconciliation, not because I want to prove my spouse wrong or prove this person wrong or get an audience, but I want, to, I want unity. He said, I will be there. I will command a blessing and you will never get to that perfect place God wants you until you do that. So let's end with this. Back to the book. Um, nine boys on a boat. So this crew 
You can go, um, go ahead and throw up that first picture, Elliot. It's, they're from Washington University. They're, they, this is an actual picture of it. So this is the Berlin Olympics. Um, they beat several Ivy League schools to get there to become the team that represents Team USA for the Olympics back in 1936. Hitler, who was this crazed, demonized man, was using this event as a propaganda event. He wanted to show the, the um, greatness of the Aryan race of, of Germany to the whole world, and they were doing good. They'd won five medals already, five gold medals in that Olympics already in, this, um, in the rowing events, but this was the big event. There were 75,000 people there watching the event, all gathered around, and the night before that, the crew from Washington University had one of their crew members get terribly, terribly sick. And the coach was going to replace him with one of their alternates. But listen to the, the uh, it's a direct quote from the book. It said that, that the whole crew came together and went to the coach. The whole crew came together and came to the coach. And they told the coach, coach, we have never been able to get swing with one of our alternates. We've only been able to get it with this person on our boat. And so we are, they said this guy could barely keep his head up. I don't know if he felt that he was, they were doing him a favor or not, but they said, no matter what happens, if you can just get him on that boat, we will take him where he needs to go. We will cover for him, but we want him on our boat. And so the race started, he, he was there the next morning. Um, they say that the crowd was so loud that Team USA was not able to hear at the very beginning. None of them could hear, but um, just where Team USA was placed in the line, they couldn't hear anything. So right at the offset of the, of the race, Team USA fell to the back of the pack. So they, they were the last boat in, in the race. And they said that Germany was going out. They were in first place. Germany held the position of first place the entire race. And what happened was they say that Hitler came. He was there on the scene. You can throw up that picture. And Hitler was standing there with a pair of binoculars on. This is an actual picture of him. They said he was standing there with binoculars on, watching the race. And they said he was slapping his knee. He was laughing. He was rejoicing. He was saying, we're going to win this race. We're going to kill Team USA. We're going to get our final gold. And we're going to beat them. And they said that the crowds were just cheering Deutschland, Deutschland. They were, uh, they were Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. And they said that he was in this giddy, demonic um, state of of mine. Team USA is pushing, remember, 40 to 45 strokes per minute, and they were doing everything that they could, and they could not get in front of that boat. But they were doing one thing, and they said, this is where the miracle happened. The other team started to rejoice because they were almost at the end. But he said the coach saw something that none of the team members could see. And they don't really go into detail about what it was, but he saw something, and he said that he, he told his team slow your pace. And so when they were about to lose the race, they slowed the pace to about 32, 33 strokes. And they say that what he saw made them immediately go into swing. And they just easily rode 32 to 33 against 45 to four, uh, 44 to 45. And they say right at the end, it was as if the boat lifted off the water and they came in and they beat Germany. And they say that Adolf Hitler at that moment took his binoculars, grew incredibly silent, simply dropped them to the ground and walked off. Can I ask you a question? How many of you would like to see that happen to Satan in your life? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> that we would choose the right crew wisely that we would encourage them and they would encourage us with all our heart that we would strive to forgive and be forgiven that we would bear one another's weaknesses as they bear with you we would walk in such unity that the holy spirit would just get us into that place in our marriages in our homes in our relationships in our church where everyone else is going like this and we're just in that safe place with god we're working hard we're in the race but god is bringing us to a place that we can never go on our own that's what God wants to do in your life. Would you all stand? And just bow your heads with me this morning, if you would. I'm going to ask just one simple question. And it's in the spirit of this. Remember how we started. The Lord is searching the whole earth right now. 
He's looking for landing strips for his Holy Spirit. He's looking for a, a landing strip of a heart and a person and a life that would say, I want unity. And maybe everyone else in your boat right now says, I don't want any unity. And you're the first one. But if you're willing to say, God, I'm going to put my own hopes, my own dreams, my own desire, my own victory, my own voice, my own um, uh, being able to be right. Say, I'm going to lay that aside. And God, I'm going to willfully receive you, Coach Jesus, into the boat of my life. And the peacemaker is going to come into your boat and he's going to begin to help make peace in those relationships. I fully believe that. I fully believe that. Satan says, I'm going to come and steal, kill, and destroy. But God says, listen, I'm going to come in. I'm going to speak to your storm. And I'm going to pull you out of it. When Jesus finds a heart dedicated and desiring unity, he says, there I will command a blessing. So really, close your eyes with me, church. Close them tight. I'm just going to ask this one question. Is there anyone in this room that you would simply say this. I'm going to make it so simple this morning. Believers, non-believers, if you've never given your life to Jesus or if you've lived your whole life for Jesus, and you'd simply say this, Jesus, I need to invite you into my boat. I'm going to, I want to will, willfully right now invite you into the, the boat of my family, whatever it is, the boat of my church, the boat of my friendships, the boat of my, the boat of my marriage. But God, I need right now to willfully, with my own voice, invite you back into my boat. I need you, Holy Spirit, to lead me and guide me because I'm toiling against the storm. I'm going as hard as I can, and I feel like I'm not getting anywhere, but I need you to come in. You need to direct me. I give you my life. I willingly, willfully invite you into my boat right now. If that's you, raise your hand. It's real simple. Amen. Lots of hands. Who else? Just come in, Jesus. Well, Father, I just let me just speak a blessing over you. Father, I just speak a blessing over every hand that was raised. Holy Spirit, coach, come in. Coach, come in and speak to our, our marriages, speak to our relationships, speak to our brokenness. I'm going to do one other thing. Hold hands real quick. Just grab hands with someone around you. I know some of you don't like this, and I apologize for that. Let's do this as a church. Father, we just welcome you into our marriages, into our homes, into our relationships. God, we, we pray that you reopen doors of communication. God, we pray that offenses would be laid down, that understanding, God, that the, um, the enemy gets us so confused, but God, you can bring um, sense back to us. God, bring sense back to where there's confusion. God, where, where there's ill words, um, bring peace. God, where there's forgiveness that's needed, where I need to ask forgiveness, where someone needs to forgive me. God, where, wherever we're at, God, we pray that you do that. Holy Spirit, come into our boats, lead us through our storm, and get us to where we need to go. God, I just pray that blessing over everyone. I pray this, God, that you command a blessing on families. You command a blessing on marriages. And God, please, we, we ask just almost selfishly, we, we ask, command a blessing on this church. Help us to walk in these last days in the ways you want us to. In Jesus' name, in Coach Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys. Amen. Listen, have an awesome Sunday. Go out and enjoy. Thank you. It was a little warm in here today. We are working on that. Um, so hopefully you won't have to bring buckets of ice next week. Love you guys. Amen.